Okay, I'd, I'd like to, uh, like to uh, say a, a couple things. I've, I've asked the audience a couple times to please refrain from applause or um, hissing. Uh, it is slowing our comments down. I'll ask one more time, but honestly, if it continues um, to happen, we will speed up the process and uh, get into our board uh, discussion. Again, I understand there are strong opinions, strong feelings. I'd like everybody to have the chance to comment, but we are going to end public comment somewhere around 4.15 or 4.30 so that board members may have an opportunity to debate this issue and vote. We're allowed to be in this room till five o'clock. So again, uh, please be respectful of opposing points of view. Respect, be respectful of everybody's uh, um, time, but we'll need to move through this as best, um, best we can. So uh, if you can keep your comments as brief as possible, that will allow us to get to as, as many folks as we possibly um, um, can. So I appreciate your understanding and patience, Vice President Perez. Uh, I'm gonna call up, I'm gonna call up the next five people. Please um, take a seat and after that, I'll call up each additional person. Nancy Shulock, Daniel Halford, Alex Shamas, Karen Sagnor and Antonio Mines. The first speaker is Nancy Shulock with CSU Sacramento. She's a task force member. Thank you. I want to speak as a researcher, as someone who's familiar with the research into student success that's going on across the country. Uh, and I want to emphasize that the research that the task force reviewed and that is reflected in its recommendations is motivated precisely by the need to do a better job to serve the most vulnerable students. Uh, states across the country, legislatures, governors, researchers, college leaders are all very concerned with the changing faces of their workforces and uh, students in their community colleges. And so there is a lot of research underway that, let me say again, is motivated precisely by the need to do a better job to serve vulnerable students. And that's the research that we drew on, and that is the research that I'm very pleased to say is reflected heavily in the recommendations. <coughs> Just some examples, more structure and guidance for students. Uh, helping students into programs of study, access into programs, rather than into courses that may not add up to anything. Uh, providing incentives and encouragement for students to make good choices, which include fundamentally seeking the services and the guidance that will be increasingly made available to them. And having good data so that colleges can uh, review that and be more publicly accountable uh, precisely for helping vulnerable students. So I think together is a very, um, uh, very powerful package that if implemented effectively will greatly increase the contributions of the community colleges to the future social and economic health of California. I, I want to stress the urgency of this problem. We at the task force looked at the data. I, in my job, <coughs> see the data. The data is very scary. It is a very urgent problem that California faces to uh, educate, do a better job of educating vulnerable populations that will increasingly make up the college population and the workforce of California. Thank uh, you. Too many students are- I need your final oh. comments, please. Thank okay. you. That's okay, thank you. <laughs> Catherine Maloney. Daniel Hofford from City College of San Francisco. Uh, first, the unique importance and usefulness of our community colleges is that they serve many different kinds of needs for all the different groups of adults in our society from all backgrounds and levels of education, enabling them to succeed in many different ways. Because these task force recommendations limit success to a very narrow definition based only on certificates, degrees, and transfers, the task force would reduce our community colleges to junior colleges, 
thus eliminating many of the ways they help students succeed. I bought 50 copies. I, I believe that uh, all the Board of Governors has a copy of the nine examples I brought of City College student success stories that do not fit the very narrow task force definition. Second, the task force report makes two indefensible assumptions related to funding. First, it assumes that there is no hope of any significant increase in funding, either now or in the future. This ignores both the probability that at some point the economy will improve and the necessity of making significant changes in our tax laws, for example, requiring millionaires and corporations to pay their fair share. Second, it assumes that because there is not enough funding now for all the wonderful services and functions our community colleges perform, those services and functions must be drastically reduced. This shows zero vision. In fact, the task force has it backwards. The way to improve our community colleges is to look at all their underfunded needs, recommend that these needs be met, and inform the governor and legislature how much additional funding is needed. Then it's up to the legislature and the voters how to raise the money. State budget difficulties cannot justify cutting away at the community college's mission of lifelong education of all Californians. Limiting this mission would be a drastic and probably irreversible step, so it would be conceivable only if all the stakeholders reached a consensus which would never happen. Thank you. In fact, the task force members could not even comments, reach please. a consensus among themselves. Thank you. Catherine Maloney and Chanel Williams. The next speaker is Alex Schumas from City College of San Francisco. My name is Alex Schmaus. I'm here to reject the Student, sax, uh, student Success Task Force recommendations. Um, I think we need to defend the right of all students to equal access to education. I think Peter McDougall in your opening remarks, you said open access is nice, but um, that's not good enough, Peter McDougall. We have to defend open access for everyone. We can Also, we cannot separate the questions of accessibility and equity from student success. They're related. Education is about developing independent and critical thought. It's not about creating transfer factories to suit the needs of big business. We've seen this before. The recommendations look a lot like no child left behind in the K through 12 system, Bush's policy, um, which meant moving more towards standardized testing, which we know is biased. It tests more what your, uh, inc the income level of your parents is than on your ability to succeed in, in, in education. Um, it also means making students and schools compete with one another for a shrinking pot of public money. We have to reject this. California is one of the wealthiest places in the world. We know there's money to fund public education. We need to go get it. We need to reject the democratic credentials of this meeting and this board right here. I think it's no coincidence that we're meeting in January in the dead of winter while students are not in session. Um, the number of students at the community colleges, 2.6 million of us that know the details of this um, is not high enough. Uh, the, and if you wanna push this through, um, and radically restructure the community college system uh, in a way that is against the interests of the majority of students, then you're gonna pay a price for it. We all learned how to disrupt business as usual in the Occupy movement this fall. We're learning how to fight back. And so you be, better be ready for a struggle if you wanna push this forward. Okay. <laughs> Audience, please. Michael Florentino. The next speaker is Karen Saganor, City College of San Francisco. If I may, I just heard the phone speak. That's fine. Right. I think, can I just, for a minute, I think I'm missing a couple of speakers. I had called Chanel Williams. Okay. I had also called um, Catherine Maloney. Antonio Mimes. Uh, my name's Karen Saginor. I'm from uh, City College of San Francisco, the Academic Senate President. Uh, as you just heard Nancy Shulak talk about the motivations of the task force and the intent, uh, which were very good, and a lot of effort was put into making sure that the intent came through clearly. What I don't think is in this report, well, it's definitely not in the report, is an examination of the many kinds of results that are not intended 
but will come about as a result of the recommendations that are here. I've passed out to you and I put at the back a little draft chart that I put together and clearly more work needs to be done on this that sketches out a few of the unintended consequences that will arise from this. Uh, one, and I want to point out to you in particular, a couple I will, a recommendation 3.2. As you know, this adds criteria for the poorest students to receive fee waivers. At other public comment opportunities, Chancellor Scott has explained at length why the criteria is advisable. But the consequence is, that has not been addressed, is that our poorest students are going to be held to different standards than other students. At this chart that I've passed out, if you look at the top of it and you compare the top left with the top right, you see that California subsidizes education beyond the 100 and 110 credit, credits for the students who can afford to pay $36 a credit. If you can pay $36, the state pays the rest. But if you can't afford to pay $36, then you're out of luck. You will not, you will be shut out of the program. It's not small numbers of students. The early drafts estimated that $89 million would be saved by this one recommendation. At my college, 80% of the students that will be shut out will be students of color. This is not equal opportunity. Now this particular one, uh, 3.2, has to go to, uh, through education code change. So there will be discussion of it at that, that level. You're not, you're going, not going to make that change today, but you are being asked if you endorse the recommendations, you are endorsing that change along with the others. Oh, I want to speak briefly on another recommendation which does not require ed code change, and that's the one that Chancellor Scott ta started by talking about. I need your final comments, about, please. You, which is to encourage part-time students to give them loan packages to go into debt to be mm. full-time with no guarantee that they'll ever be able to repay those loans. Other people, I think, have spoken about that or will speak about that. A very difficult problem for our students. Thank you. Michelle Dowling. The next speaker is Antonio Mines. California um, on Community College in San Francisco. All right. This declaration is an enactment to discredit the nine part 22 recommendation packet being submitted today by the California Community College Task Force, a privately funded state chartered super committee whose special, who special interests include crucifying 60% of the San Francisco City College student body. I say crucified because public funding for community colleges are at an all time low and more cuts are being made as I speak. While private funders lay in bed with out of touch politicians monopolizing the ballot, illegally endorsing legislation that does not reflect our student body's need for success. So on behalf of the Black Star Liner Coalition and the entire California community family and every other concerned taxpaying citizen, we implore the Board of Governors to condemn State Senator Carol Liu and her super committee for devising a plan that will reduce a large percent of our student body to an output based product lacking the human capital needed to defend ourselves from the 1%'s attempt to capitalize from this country's economically depressed state. This recommendation packet does not accurately outline a success plan focused on the achievement of each individual student. What, this recommend, what these recommendations do is the complete opposite. A group, of, a group of elitists are one small step away from having their beliefs being made law. The government still feels it is their manifest destiny to control education through private funding and predatory targeting. Carol Liu and our central planning state slate is attempting to single-handedly manage community college education from enrollment to fund allocation all over California. How valid is a recommendation written by a politician who ordered that the recommendation be written in the first place? This process is unconstitutional. The public did not vote for each member on this task force. Therefore, we do not acknowledge their findings. The public never agreed that the study's protocol will properly account for the needs or the demands of our student body. Therefore, we the people were not par active participants in this study, nor will we the student body be the beneficiaries of their recommendations. Legislation should reflect concerns from the people and protect the people's right to live equally and pursue happiness. Thank you and God bless. Ana Acevedo. The next speaker is Catherine Maloney, uh, student City College of San Francisco. Thank you. I want to particularly address recommendation number seven, uh, which discusses the stronger chancellor's office to drive and refocus the system. And it's seeking the authority, the appropriate staffing, and adequate resources. And it seems everyone's seeking appropriate staffing and adequate resources. Um, so as part of the volunteer student crew that films the board of trustee meetings for the uh, San Francisco City College District, um, month after month, I see all the parties there working constructively to make 
very fine-grained cuts to budgets and initiatives, and even in these difficult times, they're committed to offering the classes that students need, which seems to be what we're talking about, that students need classes and we're discussing how to ration these classes. Um, the school spends 92% of its budget just putting faculty in front of students. And I, as a student, really appreciate the difficult choices that they made. At City College in particular, the faculty has taken permanent pay cuts, the board support staff has been trimmed back, and so I really do not want to see these scarce monies go to additional staff at the state level. I would ask the state office to be creative, to juggle your existing resources, and to engage uh, student and faculty at the state schools to, in part of this data generation, sharing of best practices, and the transparency the whole state needs to see what's going on. Um, I really applaud the focus on tracking long-term outcomes. It is correct that there are a lot of students who are getting lost and could, um, with some better information and guidance, um, be better served, but definitely trust that the local community colleges are already working on these challenges. The local community colleges can be responsive to the, dis the distinct needs of their areas, um, and these communities can be easily heard by their local boards. They can attend in their area rather than having to travel to Sacramento. So I would also just kind of echo the concerns that have been brought up um, by others that the language of these recommendations is very broad and so the interpretation could go a number of ways. The timing of this final draft and this session happening during our finals and then before our spring break starts is very unsettling. Um, and this effort to cherry pick students who uh, will get preferential treatment um, rather than keeping a student population as a unified body that really has to fight for educational funding, I think is counterproductive to the voter base we need to approve additional monies for education. So I need your final comments. Um, thank you, and I urge the rejection of this draft. Thank you. Susan Lopez. The next speaker is Chanel Williams, City College of San Francisco. Good afternoon, everyone, and again, my name is Chanel Williams, and I'm a student at City College of San Francisco and proud to advocate for students at the largest community college in the nation and the second largest college among all colleges in the nation as VP of Communications for the Associated Students Council. I am here to formally oppose the recommendations proposed by this body to and to express my extreme disappointment and frustration with this process and the tasks you have all been charged with. I grew up in San Francisco surrounded by drugs and violence, and by the age of 15 years old, had already made contact with both the juvenile justice system and the foster care system. I came to CCSF at 18 years of age, straight out of the system, not knowing my educational goal and how to be a student. No one in my family has graduated from college, and where I come from, education is not a priority. Surviving and meeting your basic needs is. I could not commit to be full-time. I had to work to provide for myself as well as my family, and it has taken me longer than two years to get to where I am now, which is applying to UC Berkeley and Stanford this fall to transfer, and I'm proud of my struggle. People in my community, African American people, Latino people, Pacific Islander people, low income people, single parents, ex-offenders, people with language barriers, social and economic barriers will be negatively impacted by these recommendations. Your body highlights in this packet that our schools have been seriously defunded, but your recommendations speak to the fact that that doesn't matter. 2.6 million students will have to compete for access to our education. This is not about success. This is about making the most disenfranchised students pay for an economic crisis that is not our fault. We need funding, not these recommendations. Community college is about access for all. We do not need lobbyists influencing our government to ration education, which is the right of all American citizens. 60% of City College of San Francisco students will be impacted by this. We need to look at ways to refund education and provide needed support services like EOPS and Guardian Scholars, which I'm a part of. We will be here advocating at the legislature, if you guys choose to pass this, to make sure these recommendations will not become law. I need your final comment, please. Solutions like the millionaire's tax will, is what we need to look at. City College of San Francisco has also begun to implement solutions looking at equity, like priority registration for high school students Thank and you. accelerated courses in English and math. Education is not a commodity. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I need to ask again. Please stop the applause. Uh, okay, if it, if it continues, I will need to reduce the amount of time everybody has. 
please be respectful of this process. Lori Fassbinder. The next speaker is Michael Florentino from City College of San Francisco. Uh, well, my name isn't uh, Michael Florentino. I'm actually DeBray Carpenter. Um, I'm also known as Fly Benzo. Uh, I'm a city college student, and I'm also a community activist and advocate in the Bayview Hunters Point community 94124 and beyond. And I'm also a political prisoner out fighting a case for uh, filming an officer, uh, which is an, an act that's in full, I mean, it's fully supported by the First Amendment. And uh, I'm out on $95,000 bail, but I go to City College and I take six units and I have a 4.0 grade average. I missed three classes incarcerated because I was incarcerated for 10 days for this crap. And uh, I still managed to pull off a 4.0 while fighting a case. And um, if that's not success, I don't know what is. Um, I, think, I think the main thing here, the main issue, is the definition of success. Who, who defines success? I mean, to an African American, me even being in college is successful. When it's other people out there unemployed, and it's people selling drugs and pimping and hoeing, and all, I mean, anything you could think of. It's, it's all going on right outside my house. I walk outside, I see all that. I see drug, I see dope fiends, I see drunks. But I mean, us African Americans aren't being taken into consideration, and we, I saw, I saw one person on the, uh, on the student success, the student success task force who was African American, and one person who was a student, and I feel like both of those are huge disparities, and we're not being represented correctly. And where is the democratic process in Thank this? You. You know what I mean? Where is the democratic process? We try to force democracy on all these other nations and all these other countries, but we're not practicing democracy in our own home. Thank you. And I want to close with Uhuru Sana. And if you don't know, that means freedom now. Scott Lay. The next speaker is Michelle Dowling, Santa Rosa Community Junior College. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Dowling. I'm a student at the Santa Rosa Junior College as well as the Associate Students Vice President of Advocacy. Uh, though the task force has put forward this final package for the Board of Governors to review for approval today, I would like to acknowledge that we at the Santa Rosa Junior College do have many concerns. Uh, though some of the recommendations we do support, there are several that we would do more harm to students than to bring actual success. We support the earlier recommendations of the document because they would ideally help some students get on a clear path, provide transparency and consistency in the assessments between community colleges, and bring centralized and integrated technology. The main problem with these, however, is that the funding is being continuously cut, which is absolutely key in maintaining and providing support for key resources and support systems for these students. We frown upon the approval of this entire package as a whole because it would be marginalizing students and college systems by limiting the bog fee waiver for those students in great and immediate need, forces students to pick a major too early, does not clearly address funding, does not allow opportunity for personal enrichment, provides an ambiguous and lineal definition of success, homogenizes students across the state, changes the mission of community colleges, does not account for the different demographics and needs at different community colleges, models success after just one type of learner, standardizes tests, erodes the principles of academic freedom, gives less power to local authorities, and so on and so on. This task force should never have been titled the Student Success Task Force because it is very inaccurate and misleading. The real issue is funding and rationing education. We ask that you, as our governing board of community college officials, do not rush the approval of any of these recommendations. You take the time necessary to review carefully what these changes will be doing to our system, for it will be ultimately changing not just the system, but our lives, the lives of students, faculty, and administrators for future generations to come. And I wanted to close by 
finishing with a quote by Ernest Boyer, who's an American educator, served as Chancellor of State University of New York. He's a United States Commissioner of Education and President of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancements of Teaching. In regards to student competency, he stated, education for what purpose, competence to what end, and at a time in life when values should be shaped and personal priorities sharply probed, what a tragedy it would be if the most deeply felt issues, the most haunting questions, the most creative moments were pushed to the fringes of our edu institutional life. What I a monumental final comment. mistake I'm sorry. it would be. Thank you. Sorry. It's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Jeffrey Frank. The next speaker is Ana Acevedo from City College of San Francisco. Good afternoon. My name is Ana Acevedo. I'm an instructor and art department chair at City College of San Francisco. I work along with fellow staff to help students succeed. Certainly City College has its inefficiencies, as most institutions do, but I question the motives of some behind this task force's complex and rushed process. These questions are not within the scope of this discussion, but certainly must be addressed before any implementation can take place. Therefore, allow me to question a few specific recommendations made by the task force. I question the recommendation of adopting a large centralized computer system to help students meet their individual goals. If, in fact, we are all working to most effectively spend public funds in support of instructional activities, this might be a good idea. If we had clear evidence that other colleges' implementation of such a system has improved student success for those demographic groups listed in the document, then this might be a good idea. If we had evidence that an already overtaxed information technology staff would be able to properly implement a large new statewide computer system, it might be a good idea. But in our current social and economic situation, it strikes me as at best risky. I also question the recommendation that we limit a student's ability to experiment with what they study. Why do this? Lateral exploration is essential in people developing relevant and new ways of thinking and working. A popular figure, Steve Jobs, is an example of straying from the path by dropping out and taking graphic arts courses of a course that influenced his design of the Macintosh computer. Lastly, I question the very notion that degree and certificate is all important. These are indeed of value, as countless economic studies have shown, and we should do everything we can to encourage students to complete their coursework and get a degree. But a degree is really a point on a continuing of a form formal education. If someone is lacking a couple of classes to graduate, are they really unsuccessful? Um, rather, I need um, your sorry, final comment, I will, I'll final please. Um, we don't need to equate a degree or a certificate with student success. Rather, we must focus on whether a student gets the information and skill development that he or she needs to confidently progress, progress to the next phase that that student determines to be right for their life and well-being. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration of my concerns. Matt Lambert. The next speaker is Susan Lopez, City College of San Francisco. Yes, Susan Lopez, faculty, City College of San Francisco. You know, the first rule of uh, creating a plan or strategic planning in particular is that you really need to engender buy-in. And the way that you do this is by getting the stakeholders involved early in the process. They need to be involved during development and not just in a phase after development when the plan is aired. This is part of the problem here. The original uh, plan, when it went out, uh, went out with information saying this is to be a sweeping plan, sweeping recommendations, bold recommendations that will transform the vision, the mission of the colleges, will transform our operations. And as a result, we had 22 very controversial recommendations. Well, there's been quite a lot of tinkering around the edges, some very serious tinkering in some cases, but what do we have now? We still have 22 very controversial recommendations. There has been airing of the recommendations, but to my mind, there has not been vetting of the recommendations, because vetting of the recommendations would indicate that there was a process of growing consensus. I don't think that this is a consensus document the way that some of the members of the board undoubtedly would prefer to see it. I think that what we have here is a very controversial document. 
and I think that's going to be a problem. One of the problems is that the recommendations in the latest draft have been greatly expanded to include details and some information that was previously in the text of the document. Those have been now pulled into the recommendations themselves. I don't think that that version of the recommendations actually was the version that went out to the board today for its meeting. I believe the version that went out was still a very abbreviated version that did not include all that information. I so your final comment, here we have internal and external stakeholders who have not seen the current draft, the current recommendations. I ask that you forward, if you are going to forward this to the legislature, that you forward it with your concerns. Thank you. Stephen to Giorgio. The next speaker is Lori Fassfinder, Rancho Santiago Community College District. Good afternoon. I'm a dean of non-credit instruction, and I have been working in non-credit for 16 years as an administrator in the community college system. Um, I wanted to share with you, I brought a series of letters that I left here for you also. I voiced the concerns of over 6,000 inmates in the Orange County jails who are enrolled in various classes that we offer to the, to the inmates, but most particularly the 1,000 or so students that are enrolled each year in our substance abuse classes and our parenting, effective parenting classes. These classes have been recommended in 4.1 that perhaps they could be for fee. Well, they can't be for fee in the city jail or in the, in the city jail or in the county jail because the inmates don't have the funds to pay for those. Uh, this would really be a detriment if, if we had to cancel these classes, we couldn't offer them anymore because there is no other venue for them to take the classes while they're incarcerated. We are the only venue available to them. So I would have loved to have brought inmates with me today, but it really wasn't possible. <laughs> <laughs> so that you could hear their voices. So instead, I have brought about 150 letters that they have written and forgive them for writing in pencil, but they're only allowed little short golf pencils. So they're sometimes a little hard to read, but I brought those for you today. And I wanted to share with you that community college is more than just degrees and certificates. The community college historically has been the vital, the vitality of the community by providing the education that the community feels it needs, which is at the local level. And in the Rancho Santiago Community College District and in Orange County, that local level includes serving our inmates in the Orange County and the city, the Santa Ana City Jail. Uh, Santa Ana College serves them. Uh, these classes have really improved the lives of people. It's one of my greatest addictions is to go into the jails and talk to inmates on how the classes have impacted them. <coughs> and so I urge you to seriously consider the negative impact that an elimination of any type of program at the state level would be, such as health and safety or parenting, parent education, and what that would be, what, what impact that would have on the local level Thank and you. statewide, and to leave the decision to our own local boards. Thank you. Kitty Lou, the next speaker is Scott Lay, Community College League. Uh, thank you very much, members. Let me first go off of my prepared statement and just say that I heard a lot of common themes from proponents and opponents of the report. And I think we all agree with them. And I just, this late part in the afternoon, I want to take a moment to agree that it's unconscionable that California higher education was cut by $2 billion in the current year. It is unconscionable that this system has turned away 400,000 students. It is unconscionable that our funding per student is 20% below what it was in 2000. But more importantly, it's unconscionable that we have a 20-point achievement gap between African-American and Latino students and their white and Asian counterparts. Filipino students, similarly in many of our colleges, a 15 to 20 percent achievement gap. We cannot ignore this any longer. Last year, with a focus on student success, equity, and access, the Community College League of California published a 2020 vision for student success. We presented that report to you. It called for increasing community college completions by one million, eliminating the achievement gap, and closing the participation rate gap, particularly among Latino students. The League is supportive of the focus of the Student Success Task Force report and recognizes the common themes uh, and recommended policy and practice changes between the 2020 vision and the task force report. The League encourages the Board of Governors to accept the task force report and transmit it pursuant to the law to the legislature before March 1st, 2012. 
We recognize that there are specific questions and concerns over some of the task force recommendations. I can't get unanimity among the 435 trustees or the 136 college presidents. <laughs> Much work has yet to be done. We will continue to work closely with all districts and constituency groups on implementing statutes, regulations, and funding changes to ensure local control and to maintain our collective focus on student success and access and the intersection between the two, which is equity. Thank you very much. Raymond Bergstrong Wood. The next speaker is Jeffrey Fang from City College of San Francisco. Good afternoon, members. Um, I come before you today in multiple capacities. Um, first, I am serving as student trustee of City College of San Francisco. I'm also the Region 3 Senator and also a, a member of the CCAS, which is California Community College Association of Student Trustee. Now, I'd like to first, first of all report that our Student Trustee Association has taken a position of opposed to the package of the Student Success Task Force. We recognize and we, did, we spent over a month going over everything in detail, explaining and examining why and how we think and what we think, and we have documents to back that up. However, as a package put together, it is not going to help the students that are in need now. So on top of that, I'll, like to, I'll transition into, of course, the obvious CCS position. What you hear today are obvious emotion. They are real. They are here, and they are here to express their voice. And I implore you to see past just the pure emotion that they are genuinely concerned about their own education, and they want to get through it, and they have the will to push. Now, I'll go specific to a few uh, recommendations as requested by my uh, trust, uh, student trustees, fellow student trustees. Um, recommendation 4.1 and 8.2. On um, 4.1, what we have here is a prioritization. Now, while the language itself sounds very pretty, and I do agree, you know, it, it's good writing in many parts. But here, the issue here is if the last point here says amend to basically the student can enroll in class without re getting a apportionment. The, the real concern we have here is what if the, there's money now? What if there's money down the line coming behind it in prioritization? And lastly- I need your final comment, please. Yes, thank you. Lastly, from, for 8.2, and that's already been uh, widely uh, reported, it's just that my question only is on this the student support in initiative, um, it has not, is ambiguous and does not have not clearly defined things that we, the student, can focus on. Thank so, you. So thank you very much. Juan Gutierrez. Matt Lambert, Community College of San Francisco. Good afternoon, my name is Matt Lambert. Um, I think it's really telling that this afternoon we've uh, heard a unanimous uh, rejection of this uh, student success task force by, um, by students. We've had a uh, near unanimous rejection of this package by uh, educators, and we've had unanimous support by the business community. I think that is very telling in this time and era that we're living in. Who supports this and who doesn't? The people who are in our community colleges do not want this. The people who w stand to make money off of us want this. That should say everything about it. Um, I've also heard a lot of concern from uh, people about uh, uh, supporting uh, underprivileged uh, communities. One way we can support underprivileged communities is by getting police out of their neighborhoods. Uh, that's one thing we can do. Uh, we can end real oppression in this, in this country, in this planet, on this world. Um, let's start there and, uh, and then everything else will fall in line. Thank you very much. Katie Contreras. The next speaker is um, Stephen Giorgio from City College of San Francisco. Hello, Board of Governors. Uh, my name is Stefan Giorgio. I'm a student at San Francisco City College. Um, on page 10, you ask readers to resist focusing on individual recommendations and instead consider them as a whole. And as a whole, I think they completely miss the mark on the role and value of education in our society. 
and I'll go from there. Um, so, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast. I went to Northwestern University. I graduated and got a bachelor's degree in theater. I moved out here and worked at Family Service Agency of San Francisco in, in the city. I thought a lot about going to grad school, but I was completely not sure what I wanted to do. So I was like, okay, so I'm gonna take some city college classes. And it's been amazing. It's been one of the most special places for me because the classes that I take I take with such a diverse group of people in terms of backgrounds and ages and experiences, and that's what makes the community, the learning community, so vital at City College. Um, so as far as the recommendations, um, they say that in recommendation four that um, Courses that do not support programs of study and that solves and that solely serve as enrichment or recreational purpose should not be subsidized with state funds. You go on to say we'll ensure that finite resources are used for educational objectives, and you also go on to say not diverting scarce public resources from higher priority instructional needs. There are resources. I hope that each of you will be voting for the millionaire's tax and for the oil severance tax that will be on the ballot in November. If you really do care about our educational needs and us as students, then you would do that because there is money there. California is home to 53 of the country's largest corporations, 88 billionaires with an estimated wealth of $250 billion. The money is obviously there. This student success scorecard reprioritizes so that the needs of a dysfunctional legislature are put at the bottom, are, are put at the top, while those of students are put at the bottom of the ladder. And also, the special intellectual curiosity that is within each of us from all backgrounds, races, regardless of financial abilities, that is what needs to be lighted. And this success task force recommendation just stamps on it. It completely misses the mark on what education is. And I'd like to end with some quotes. It is in fact nothing short of a miracle that the modern methods of instruction have not yet entirely strangled the holy curiosity of inquiry. For this delicate little plant, aside from stimulation, stands mainly in need of freedom. Without this, it goes to rack and ruin without fail, that's Albert Einstein. And Noam Chomsky gave a speech at the I University to of Toronto, your comments, on, specifically on California, this is it. There's no way to measure the human and social costs of converting schools and universities into facilities that produce commodities for the job market, abandoning the traditional ideal of the universities, creating creative and independent thought and inquiry, challenging perce perceived beliefs, exploring new horizons, and forgetting, ex forgetting external ex constraints. That's an ideal that's no doubt been flawed in practice, but to the extent that it's realized is a good measure of the level of civilization achieved. Thank you. That's Noam Chomsky. Christopher Capaldin. The next speaker is Kitty Liu from City College of San Francisco. Wait, before you start my time, can you just um, answer a point of process for me? I was wondering why uh, people in the audience cannot clap during um, in between speakers just because you were saying that we shouldn't it's, clap. It's your to if you choose to use your time this way, you can. I just wanted to, I, you I to think answer I, I a think point I of process I think I was for me, no, because you were that saying was, because that it, it cuts speakers' time, but it's would you between stop, start speakers. The time, please? Okay, well, thank you for the democratic way that you just uh, answered my questions so that I was very clear about the uh, process. Um, I respectfully oppose the Student Success Task Force, rec Task Force recommendations in its entirety. There doesn't seem to be any recommendations to demand more money for education, just recommendations to prioritize funds that can better streamline students through the system, which is based on the premise that there's something wrong with our community college uh, system as it exists. I agree with everything that our EOPS representatives have stated, that the uh, Student Success Task Force recommendations punish poorly performing students and places blame for this on the community college system that currently exists. If there's something wrong with our community college system, it's that we don't get enough money. It's that groups like CalWORKs and EOPS don't get enough money. I sympathize with the concerns that the attorney from Malta spoke about, that many students, especially students of minority and disenfranchised groups, are having trouble in the community college system. But let's look at why students are having trouble in our schools. From 2005 to 2009, median wealth fell by 66% among Latino households, 53% among black households, and 16% among white households. This is because much of the wealth for working people were tied to their homes and home foreclosures were, um, have disproportionately impacted blacks and Latinos since minority communities were steered into predatory subprime loans by mortgage lenders. Besides 
home foreclosures, disproportionate rates of incarceration against uh, people of color, threats of deportation and lack of resource, resource access that affect millions of the undocumented, and the anemic job market that offers a mere one per position for every five um, job applicants have made it near impossible impossible for a majority of students to excel I need your in school. Final comment, if the Student Success Task Force is really interested in helping all of the 99% and not just the ones who are lucky enough to be on the right track, your recommendation should be to support the Millionaire's Tax Proposal that many of our Thank teachers you. Uni unions have You need have to conclude your comments, um, please. Fully fund all services, including CalWORKs and EOPS. Fully fund financial aid for all students. Make education free and accessible your, your to everyone. Don't support uh, initiatives oh. that Oh. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're slowly endangering public comment here. If this continues to escalate, if this continue, I'm just telling you, if this continues to escalate from a civil debate and comment, then I will end public comment and we will go to board member discussion. That's, that, that is your right as a citizen, and I totally agree with you on that. You, you, have, you have every right. But this is a process here. This is a meeting. If you want to continue to disrupt it, that's your choice, but it will leave me no choice than to go to board member discussion. If you would like to have your other colleagues speak, then let them do so. Okay, next speaker, please. You cut me off. Okay, Madeline Mueller. The next speaker is Raymond Bergstrom Wood from College of Marin. Hello, um, I'm Raymond Bergstrom Wood, uh, student trustee at College of Marin. And uh, first, I would like to thank the Student Success Task Force for the uh, time and work that they spent creating the uh, recommendations. But I have to re respectfully oppose because uh, first, there was 22 to 21 members on the Student Success Task Force, and only one student. That is one student to represent 2.6 million people. It's impossible, and it's only 5% of the membership. It's ridiculous. And also, you're leaving out the most important input. The students know how to navigate the system. We are on the path to success through the community college system. And while I'm on the, on, while I mention success, that's another major problem that <coughs> I have with the recommendations. The, community, the measure of success in the community college system is not limited to who receives a degree, a certificate, or a, uh, any, a uh, yeah, degree or a certificate. It's people come to the, the community colleges to fulfill their educational goals. And once they fulfill those goals, they move on. They don't necessarily have to be limited by the mandates of a degree or a certificate. And um, I'd also like to say that the uh, junior college system is a model in which everybody is focused towards degrees and to certificates. And that's not what we have in California. We have a community college system. It is for the community and not just for degrees. Thank you. Emily Kinner. The next speaker is Juan Guterres, California Community College. Association Student Trustee, <coughs> Parnell College. Yes, um, hello, my name is Juan, like you said. And um, I'm here to tell you that uh, as a member of CCAST, or Com California Community College Association of Student Trustees, we oppose the, the task force recommendations <coughs> because not all the community colleges have the same challenges, obstacles. Some of the schools are model schools, and some of the schools, we need help. So. Having all of them follow these recommendations is, may not be uh, what's best. Also, I want to share a, a story about my family and what brought me into the community college. My mother is an immigrant from Mexico. Uh, she was uh, going through the K-12 system here in California. Uh, unfortunately, since she didn't come here to go to school, she came here to work the fields, she had to drop out out of high school. Later, um, 
when she was in her 30s, she was already married, had four kids. She went back to the same community college that I go to now, and she became an alumni. She got her degree. She wasn't able to transfer because she has challenges. She had four kids. Um, she, she wanted to work, and that made her successful. Just the fact that, that she has an AA, not now, that, that may not make other people successful. Some people may think that they need a doctorate or they need to transfer, but that to her is gold. And to me, it's gold. And so seeing some of these recommendations are ambiguous and put people that don't graduate from high school uh, out of the golden path to uh, become a community college student and graduate and transfer, it, it just, it, it's very sad because I don't think she would have made it through without programs like EOPS, uh, financial assistance and the, the Board of Governments waivers because she didn't finish school in two years. It took her way longer than that. But you know what? She completed uh, her associates. Also, I want to leave it with uh, community colleges. The people that are the Student Trustees Association, most of us are graduating. And uh, we are not doing this because the community college is, us, is ours. We're doing it because we borrowed it from the future students. So we recommend that you don't approve today's uh, item. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Bronson. The next speaker is Katie Contreras from Community College Association of Student Trustees. South Lake Tahoe. Okay. Hi, thank you. I'd like to thank you all for taking your time to hear our comments. We appreciate that immensely. Um, my name is Katie Contreras. I am student trustee of Lake Tahoe Community College, a very small school in a very small district. Um, <laughs> I am also here as a representative of California Community College Association of Student Trustees. I am their treasurer. I am talking to you today concerning recommendation 3.4. Basically, it's, it talks about addressing the basic skills needs immediately. So within the first year of coming to a California community college. Honestly, to me, one of the, the greatest joys of coming to the community college system was the fact that I had the freedom to explore, find out where I fit in. I had just, when I came to the, the college, I had spent years on the streets, homeless, sleeping on benches. I had no idea where I fit in anymore. And by being able to explore these classes freely, I got the opportunity to find my place. Once I found my place, I developed a plan. That was when it was time for me to say, hey, this is where I'm getting serious. But I was given the opportunity to explore. And that made all the difference in the world. Because now, A, you see me here, and I'm representing 2.6 million California community college students. And I'm going to be graduating this spring. And with that, hopefully, attending Fresno State. But by giving me this freedom, I would hope that you guys can all consider maybe making an amendment. I don't feel that a student needs to right away address those basic skills. I addressed them when it was time and when it was ready and perfect for me. I am now a successful student and on my way. Thank you. Mary Lang. The next speaker is Christopher Cabalin, Student Success Task Force member. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President, Mr. President, members of the board, and Chancellor. Um, I, I'm, uh, I was a member of the task force. I'm also the mayor of the city of uh, West Sacramento, formerly worked in the, in the system. Um, and I, along with a couple other of the external task force members, had the responsibility to also provide perspectives from the people who are not in the system, not just businesses and others, but the students who, the wannabe students who come to my local community college campus that just got built in the poorest part of my city, which is the poorest city in the county, which is the poorest county in the region, who I have to say to them why they can't get into a nursing program, why they can't start their transfer program because the English class is completely filled, why the ESL class is not available for them so that they can get, take advantage of the kinds of opportunities that you've heard so compellingly about today. And then I have to say to them, uh, uh, but you know there's a class called Finding Your Buried Treasure uh, 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 that's offered at a coastal college that's available to the 1% down in Southern California um, that has nothing to do with transfer. It doesn't lead to a certificate. It doesn't lead to a degree. It is purely a leisure and recreational course, and it is not unimportant to clean up your clutter. I've seen hoarders. I know it matters. But it is not the same. What our colleges do matters a great deal. 
And when we undervalue it, when we say it doesn't matter whether you get a degree or not, it doesn't matter whether you get a certificate or not, we say that what we do doesn't make a difference. A degree is not a point on a continuum. A degree is what makes a difference in, in society, in your employability, in your ability to stay off welfare, your ability to stay out of prison. A degree is what makes the difference. The certificate makes the difference. The transfer makes the difference. And we have to stick up for it. And it is already threatened. We are rationing in the same way that 100, 100 state parks are going to close, that in my city, the state prison system is, gonna, is releasing three dozen prisoners because they've decided those are lower priorities. Um, on welfare, same thing. In every domain of government, we are setting priorities, and those priorities have to be set here as well so that we don't have to tell those students who are not getting in today. And it's not just 130,000. It's another 130,000 of their brothers and sisters who heard from that 130,000, oh, community college is not open to you. What, we're, what our degrees make a difference in people's lives, and we have an, an obligation morally to make sure that we can deliver them. And so uh, you have my, pre my prepared remarks are, are this report. Uh, the students, faculty, counselors, administrators, community members, civil rights activists that came together to put this report together and spent a lot of time on the research. This is our report. Do I love every, little, every recommendation in it? No. But as a package, this makes sense, and it is worthy of your, not just your attention and your studying for the next year, but of the fierce urgency that the crisis that's facing our communities really deserves. Thank you. Shelley Glazer, <laughs> Madeline Mueller, Madeline Mueller, Silly Col City College of San Francisco. You said silly. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. We call it that day. way. Sorry. <laughs> City College of San Francisco. City, yes, not silly. City. Um, yes, my name is Madeline Mueller. I've been a, a faculty member at City College since 1965. I'm a proud holder of an AA degree from Bakersfield College. I've been in the system a long time, decades, um, been involved with many changes, uh, uh, made many trips to Sacramento, uh, used to come to all the board meetings for a couple of decades. <laughs> it was fun. Um, and this is different, this is different. Um, what I see here are, are really not California issues. I do see this as I Google around, a lot of, um, a lot of resonance into what's happened national, is happening nationally and a lot of negative national statistics. What is the story? There are lies, damn lies, and then there are statistics. You have to be very careful about the statistics. I've been delving into them a lot. I came up with one which was very recent and yet we don't hear this one in the newspaper. Headline, this is from the American Association of Community Colleges. New study reveals dramatic 20-year growth in certificates degrees awarded by community colleges. Uh, subtitle, minority students show triple-digit increases in credentials earned. Uh, over the period of the study, uh, African American, uh, Hispanic students show a 440% increase in, in these degrees and certificates. Uh, black students show a 283% triple-digit for Asian Pacific Islanders, 90% for the white students, so we are closing the achievement gap. We're not broken. We don't need to be fixed. We need funding. We're doing a good job. <clears throat> um, as I, I sent out a report, some of you have it. I have extras if you want. This was three months ago called Connecting the Dots. Uh, when I first read this, this report <clears throat> and, and started going on to my Google and found that a lot of the funding that supported this support we're from foundations that are also supporting a lot of the student loan um, independent indebtedness kinds of situations. These are foundations supporting this report that are supporting increased testing services, a lot of money there. Uh, also the online educational industry, a lot of money there. So in conclusion, I would hope that while you must probably pass this report on, that you at least not endorse it at this point. We need more time. Thank you. Linda Williams. The next speaker, speaker is Emily Kinner, um, California Community College, Foothill de Anza. Thank you, members of the board, Chancellor Scott, members of the Student Success Task Force, and the public. My name is Emily Kinner. I'm the president of the California Community College Association of Student Trustees, and also the, uh, the student trustee for the um, de Anza College in the Foothill de Anza College District. Um, during this time of fiscal crisis and the toll it has taken on public education in the state of California, we appreciate the need for a reevaluation of how to better serve our community college students. We also understand that there are greater problems within our government's fiscal structures that are inappropriate to challenge within the context of the Student Success Task Force. Likewise, we respect the efforts and the dedication of the members of the task force during their year-long deliberations regarding student success as well as their attempts to remedy fiscal problems within our system. 
However, we are gravely concerned with the fundamental problems of this package, and we are fearful of damaging and unintended consequences with the implementation of the recommendations. For example, we appreciate the inclusion in the requirement for the implement implementation of Section 3.2, which is the appeals process for the BOG waiver. However, how can we have an effective and efficient appeals process for our most disadvantaged students if the cuts to student services don't allow the resources to do so? Will this really accomplish the intended purpose of improving student success if the implementation of further waiver restrictions comes with more administrative overhead than what can be justified with the savings produced by this recommendation? While many of the recommendations are positive, CAST has taken a position of opposition to this package, also because this package seems to be not focused on student success, but rather a filter that will eliminate our students who are less likely to succeed and therefore superficially improving the success statistics of our system. Again, we respect the work and the commitment of the task force. We appreciate that our voices have been heard and have helped in the more positive changes since the first drafts. However, we feel there needs to be more time on a package that focuses on access to serve our community and our underserved students as well as assist our student services. We need to serve our most vulnerable populations and in conclusion, because ultimately student success will be demonstrated accurately when the goal is actually student access. Thank you for your time. Sergio Cooler. Okay, if, if, if I could again, one, we have about 15 minutes left for public comment. So I'm gonna ask everyone to be as brief as possible. Um, two, those of you who out, are out there who continue to disrupt, um, if it happens again, I will move to board member discussion. I think I've been as patient as we can be. So I appreciate you expressing your your viewpoints, we've listened to them, but I'm no longer gonna tolerate the disrespect to the process or to the other speakers. Please proceed. Laura Bronson, North Orange County Community College District. Thank you, good afternoon, and thank you for your time. My name is Laura Bronson. I'm with the Older Adults Program at North Orange County Community College District. And I hold a master's degree in gerontology, and as a gerontologist, I know that continued learning and growth throughout the lifespan is the key to ch um, overcoming challenges and achieving personal and professional goals in older adulthood. Student success in community colleges is so much more than just obtaining a degree or certificate. Life-changing experiences are happening on a daily basis as students attend classes, they develop connections, they communicate with faculty and other students. Like other community college programs, our older adult programs build learning communities where students strengthen their knowledge and their support for each other. They work together to learn new challenging uh, course materials. Our courses are specifically designed for older adults who learn vital skills that are, enable them to reach their goals. And one recent example at my college is 83-year-old Crystal Snyder um, whose goal was to sharpen her brain functioning and memory to prepare for pursuing a new job. After retirement, she had noticed difficulties with her memory and this alarmed her because both her mother and her sister have dementia. So our Brain Health for Older Adults course was the accessible and affordable resource that she needed to reach her goal. Um, fearing that she too would experience debilitating cognitive decline, she enrolled in the course and her final assessment showed an 80% improvement. She reports that this progress gave her the ability and confidence she needed, and I'm happy to share here that she did land a new job which starts this month. Although Ms. Snyder reached her goal in just a single course, as with other community college programs, skills are not always mastered in one term. And on a final note, it's well known that our older adults are informed and they're active taxpayers and voters who have historically supported community colleges through active participation in our democracy. We've recently received thousands of letters of support from older adult students and organizations like AARP attesting to the values of our programs and given our need for additional revenues for our community colleges, this population can help us reach this goal. Thank you. Jim 
I'm not sure. Weir, maybe? I'm not sure. Sorry. Mary Lang is the next speaker from Mount San Antonio College. Hi, I'm Mary Lang, supervisor of the Older Adult Program at <coughs> Mount San Antonio College, and I'm also chair of the California Community <coughs> College Educators of Older Adults. Today, many Californians are outliving their retirement funds or have lost their savings due to the downturn in the economy. Older adult programs provide opportunities for seniors to learn needed skills that help improve earning potential and supplement their income. Community colleges do a great deal of training for the corporate world, a world that is frequently closed to the older adult because of their age. But job training should not just be for the corporate world. Training should also include the older adult community. Older adult programs are striving to provide alternatives that meet the needs of the older population. When it comes to employment, older adults have more challenges than any other age group. Keep in mind that not every older adult wants to stand at Walmart or can't even stand at Walmart to be a greeter. Many older adults seek flexible employment for different reasons. There are physical and health limitations which occur as we age, as well as the need to balance between employment and other life demands. Family caregiver responsibilities can be greater for older adults, especially those assisting elderly spouses and relatives. This common situation causes a need for flexible work schedule, which many employers are reluctant to offer. However, through certain OA classes, students learn how to supplement their income in innovative ways, such as being an artisan and developing a small business. In addition to learning an art or craft, for example, students are taught to sell their products, including pricing, display, and marketing. They're able to work around their caregiver responsibilities and earn a modest income to pay their rent and put food on the table. Bear in mind, older adults are digital immigrants and many experience technological shock and fear when it comes to the computer. Older adult programs teach basic computing and internet skills necessary to submit a job application. I need your final comment, please. In addition to improving skills and re-entering the workforce, older adults learn skills like online banking that teach them how to survive in today's fast-paced electronic environment Specialized courses for older adults are a key vehicle for helping seniors earn a much needed income and improve their lives. Michelle Sequeiros, the next speaker is Shelley Glazer from City College of, Sacra of San Francisco. Sorry. It's okay, it's been a long, a long day. day. <laughs> <laughs> um, guess what, I'm also from the Older Adults Program, City College of San Francisco. I'm the chair of the program. I've been in the field of aging for the last 30 years, 15 of them have been working with older adults in higher education. Um, so the students in our program are seeking and our program gives them opportunities to learn with their peers in an environment that challenges their minds and opens their lives to new possibilities. Many students are in transition from work to retirement our classes offer a way to explore new avenues of work or civic engagement as a second career. Some students come to pursue a lifelong interest to its fruition, others to test the waters before entering credit programs. Our programs are not bingo, but classes that allow our older adults to live their lives. Uh, I teach a couple of courses. One is a chronic disease self-management course that was developed by Stanford. It has been shown uh, to save money in the healthcare system. I also teach a college level writing class uh, where students learn writing fundamentals and uh, critical thinking skills through the vehicle of life story writing. In addition, students learn what steps to take to publish and about publishing resources. Uh, this class included Norma, an 86-year-old retired teacher who said she had entered a period of decline and was ready to give up. Her doctor, re doctor recommended that she get into the world, so she tried the senior center, but bingo wasn't her style. She tried concerts, lectures, and the church, but none of it worked. Then she came to one of our classes, Life Review for Older Adults, and found what she needed, a place to approach in an intellectual fashion 
and within a learning community, the issues of aging. Norma's story is just one of a thousand like it, and that is why our students are a community that will turn out to help garner for the community colleges, the support it needs for ballot initiatives, and increased revenue. My colleagues and I are more than willing to assist in this process. It'll be harder to convince our folks if their classes are no longer there. Thank you very much. Pat Mosteller, San Diego Community College. I wasn't sure if I called that name, so if I haven't, come on down. <laughs> the next speaker will be Linda Williams, um, California Community College um, Student Financial Aid. Today I'm speaking to you on behalf of CISFA, which is the California Association of Financial Aid Administrators. We represent over 500 financial aid professionals, and we're actually excited about the recommendations of the Student Tax Force and support them. We believe that the success or failure of these proposals lie in the details developed for the implementation of this plan. We support the need for establishing standards for the BOG fee waiver eligibility, both, both initially and for ongoing eligibility. We respectfully request, however, that you include financial aid professionals as stakeholders in framing the regulations that would apply our uh, satisfactory academic progress standards. Identify educational goals and administer a unit cap for BOG eligibility. We are especially concerned about the 110 unit limitation for the, for the BOG fee waiver eligibility. And we respectfully request that this limit be certified as attempted degree applicable units. While the data indicates a completion drop off for associate degree students that occurs at 110 units, the research indicates a longer time frame for transfer students and students pursuing a certificate program. A unit limit that includes only degree applicable units will allow low income, basic skills, and ESL students to reach their educational goals and to complete programs leading to transfer. Adequate consultation and thoughtfully coordinated implementation on this and other task force recommendations will result in clear standards that are consistently applied at the community colleges while encouraging student success. While seemingly straightforward, due to federal and state regulations that govern aid delivery, there could be unintended consequences as these recommendations that could restrict student access and compromise student success. Please include your financial aid stakeholders in framing your related legislation. Alex Pater. Sergio. Cuellar. Cuellar. <laughs> From so, uh, um, Californians for Justice. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, my name is Cedric Cuellar. I'm the statewide campaign director for Californians for Justice. Um, we work, we are a statewide organization that works with hundreds of students uh, that are in the community college system, um, especially students of color uh, in local communities. Um, upon receiving the recommendations, we took these to our students uh, for analysis on their end. Um, and for the most part, they were pleased in the recommendations that highlighted strategies to support them to reach their college goals. Um, at the same time, they also had some major concerns. Uh, one of those concerns, first and foremost, was the fact that only one student representative was part of the task force. Um, coming from a, a, a world of youth development, it is imperative that we trust our students, uh, especially those that are experiencing um, the everyday lives that we are making decisions on for, that they be at the table to discuss those needs um, and also be at the table to help um, be the solution um, for these problems that we have in California. Um, so some of the recommendations that we had um, some issues with uh, deal with um, looking at the recommendation to collaborate the K-12 to add uh, K-12 education committees uh, to develop college and career readiness. Uh, before we do that, we must make sure that we force the state legislature, the governor, and the Department of Education um, to address the need for equitable resources and funding um, at the K-12 level, level to make sure that these students um, are going to be meeting and are going to be able to meet and be well resourced to meet um, the needs that um, are going to be placed in front of them to get to college and also to a meaningful career. Um, another piece is looking at the statement that says uh, the system will reward successful student behavior um, and make students responsible for developing their individual education plans. Uh, we feel that the individual education plans shouldn't just fall on the student, but it should be part of the system, a joint system and student uh, piece. Uh, mainly because the fact that some of our students, especially those of color and low-income communities, come from high schools where there aren't any counselors and for the most part they may have seen only a counselor once before 
in their career and may not have um, the knowledge of what an individual plan is or how to re, uh, resource one. So um, the other piece is receiving- I need your final comment. Please. So those that receive the BOG waivers, we feel that they should be held to the same standards, but if we're gonna hold them to the same standards, we, we must make sure that we also provide supports and measures that are gonna allow them to meet those standards um, at an equitable level as all students. So with that, we can't give a wholly, um, ho wholly recommend everything on the recommendations, um, but we do say that we look forward to seeing what the next phases are and we'll be having a watchful eye to make sure that the good pieces we, we enjoyed about it are gonna push forward and those that are gonna be our concerns are, are met as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we only have <coughs> a couple minutes uh, left and I've asked the Vice President not to call um, any further uh, speakers. You all are here, but uh, unfortunately I'm gonna need you all to be as brief as possible so we can get to our board discussion. I very much apologize to the speakers that did not um, uh, get a chance to express their um, views. Those can be submitted in, in writing to the board and, and Jerry will see that uh, we get that and if the board does so choose to move this on, uh, we commit to other opportunities for the public to uh, continue to express their views. With that said, uh, again, I can only allow a couple more uh, <coughs> minutes. So, Alice. Jim Weir, Grass Valley. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jim Weir. I'm a part-time mechatronics instructor at Sierra Community College in Rockland. And we happen to know for a fact that God loves part-timers because he made so many of us. <laughs> I. Uh, I've been teaching part-time at Sierra College since 1978. And that fact really didn't hit me until last semester when I go around the room and I ask my students, why are you taking my class? So one kid answers back, uh, Professor Weir, I'm taking your class because my grandpa took your class as a young man and he thought you were a pretty good teacher. <laughs> and I've been thinking, I'm around this place for a long, long time. I had a failure last semester. Kid dropped out before he got his certificate. Got a good job. Uh, but he decided that the good job was not worth the two more units that he had to take to get a certificate. But I'll tell you what, you ever go down to Las Vegas and go to Cirque du Soleil, you'll see my students' artwork because he's maintaining the robots that make that place work. I've had, uh, last semester I had a excellent student, the best I've, one of the best I've ever had. He can't be a full-time student because he's a jailer during the day and he's got three kids to maintain at home. But he got the highest grade in the class. The second highest grade was a high school sophomore. How are you gonna put those in the boxes that you've laid out for us as what's gonna be success and what's not gonna be success? Now I freely admit I appear before you as a, as a uh, failure myself. Um, I majored in, for the first two years at San Diego State University, I majored in beer and girls and my grades reflected it. So I had to spend a semester, two semesters at a community college where I had no idea of a certificate. I had no idea that I wanted to grade, graduate. Pro I need Professor to Ware, yes, sir. I, I, I need you to come to conclusion here. I'm sorry, I really only have a couple minutes. I will come to a conclusion, Thank sir. You. If you enjoy having a beer tonight, especially if it's a Budweiser, you give thanks to my students for their canning it over in the plant. I will do so. Thank you. Pat Mosteller, San Diego Community College. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm, I am a professor for the Older Adult Program for San Diego Community College, and I have some really good news to share with you today about aging. Four years ago, my college granted me a sabbatical to research the relationship <coughs> between education and cognitive health in older adults based on brain plasticity and neurogenesis. Aging, um, or oh, I'm sorry, along with my colleagues uh, all over California, we continue to research and apply the latest scientific findings to our older adult programs. In the past, medical science believed that the machinery of the brain wore down and weakened as we age, but we now know through science that that's not true at all. The real causes of dementia and cognitive decline are noisy processing, weakened neuromodulatory control systems, disuse, and negative brain plasticity. MRIs and CAT scans confirm that all of these causes can be prevented and reversed through learning. 
We've always encouraged our students to use it or lose it when it comes to cognitive mag uh, maintenance. Now, research reveals that it's not just using your brain that keeps it healthy, but it's how you use it that really counts. OAPs teach the skills needed to help prevent and reverse cognitive decline. Cognitive functions can be improved through education by stimulating the production of neural transmitters, which are like oil for the machinery of the brain, by reversing Ms. misuse. Can you conclude? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. We have learned to incorporate all of these techniques into our older adult classes, and we do them in all of the classes we teach, regardless of the subject or the course title. Um, so I just want you to be aware that we are doing new things in the older adult classes, and it's making big strides in aging Thank in you. California. Michelle Securos. Thank you, members Director. and chancellors. I'm sorry. Executive Director, Campaign for College Opportunity. So I represent the Campaign for College Opportunity. We're a coalition of community civil rights and business leaders, and I serve as the executive director. Our mission is to increase the number of Californians that go to college and graduate. But perhaps the title that I'm most proud of is as the daughter of a seamstress who had a sixth grade education, being the first in my family to graduate and go to college. And as many of you know, over a year ago, we commissioned a report to look at community college outcomes here in California. And that report found that after six years, <coughs> only three in 10 community college students earned a certificate, a degree, or transferred. And we asked our researchers to break out that data by race, and we found that for African Americans, it was only 25%. For Latinos, it was only 22%. And I hope that all of you are as outraged by that fact as I am, and I think all of us should be. And so I wanna commend the task force for, I think, taking up the urgency of dealing with student success, regardless of the dismal budget scenario. I want to commend you and urge you to adopt the recommendations. We strongly support them, and we're strongly excited by the allies, including MALDEF, Hispanas Organized for Political Equality, the Women's Foundation, and okay. many other high-profile organizations Sikiros, that have also endorsed them. Thank you Thank you for much. your time. Okay. Alex, nice to see you. Pleasure. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the board, President Hamilstein, Chancellor Scott, for those that know me, I'm the, was former president of the Student Senate, uh, also a former task force member and a community college alumni. I don't think that you'll find a single person in this room that's in, in opposition to student success or believe that community colleges should be fulfilling the dream of the 1960 higher, educa higher education master plan of open, equitable access for every Californian that would like to attend. But the truth is, and I'm sure that all of you know, that access is already being limited, not by choice, but by the sheer lack of available seats. The door has already been closed to hundreds of thousands of people. For the majority of my tenure in student government, the community college system has been in crisis mode. At a time when more students ever were trying to get in the system and we should have been expanding, we were faced with budget cuts and the ability to ac grant access to everyone. Those in opposition to the recommendations have this opinion not because they do, do, they do not believe in student success, but because they believe in the dream of the 1960 higher education master plan. And I don't think that's something I can fault them for. What the task force recommendations remind me of is medical triage when an Limited num medical resources are used on the, be on the people that have the best chances of survival. Making those life and death decisions are not easy to make, but in our case, we must choose who gets access to classes, student support services, and educational resources based on your need and your likelihood of academic success. Without additional funding, the hard truth is that community colleges do not have the resources to be all things to all people. I'm sure that few of us consider the recommendations to be perfect or flawless, and I certainly don't. But in such dire circumstances, it would be irresponsible for, for us to do nothing and maintain the status quo. After much thought and debate, I have chose to come before the board and ask for you to approve the Student Senate, excuse me, the Student Success Task Force recommendations. However, I do ask that when you approve the recommendations, that students and alumni have the opportunity to participate in a meaningful way, okay. that performance-based yeah, funding be Alex, seriously. Alex, I gotta wrap up. Thanks. The fate of California lies in the ability of its students to finish their education. And I'm here today as a project of the community college system to say that I'm ready to fight for students to cross the finish line. Thank you. And congratulations to our new student board members. It was oh, really great to oh, see you there. Okay, um, thank you everybody for your uh, uh, testimony today. Um, at this point, I wanna move to board member discussion. Uh, and we will start by uh, first inter 
entertaining a motion. Is there a motion? I move to approve the uh, recommendation to the task force. Motion proposed by Member Baca. Do I second. Hear a second. Second. Second by Member Baum. Uh, we will now open the recommendations for discussion. The Chancellor would like to say something. <coughs> uh, first, uh, I'm leaving it now. I'm being heard. Thank you for coming and thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, I would have to say, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, it bothered me. I think you insulted some members of the task force when you said that they were but tools to loom the foundation and Carol Lou. Uh, I have to tell you that those 20 members of the task force were very independent people. Four of them were selected by the academic senate. And if they were part of some grand conspiracy, uh, we were unaware of it. Uh, so uh, I, I would prefer that we not, in our discussions, not use loaded terms like power grabs and get rid of categoricals and all those sort of things. We were trying our best to come up with uh, what would improve student success. I was quoted once as saying, I believe we have to ration education. That's not exactly what I said. I said we're already rationing education, unfortunately. And I think Alex Pater pointed that out very vividly. We're rationing education because the state has rationed the money that we now have. And so as a result, we have to ration education. And unfortunately, we're doing it kind of haphazardly. And so someone said, well, just 133,000 first-time students were turned away. Well, that's not, you know, if you got to talking about who those people are, those are people who desired an education, who desired perhaps job training and didn't have a job. And so that's no small matter. So when we, we don't have anything against older adults, I happen to be one of them. <laughs> but I would have to tell you that a lot of times we are gonna have to prioritize. Are we just gonna have to say, we just first come, first serve, and even if you're an older adult who's been taking tennis for six semesters, you get to uh, register before a first time student. And I'm not quite ready to say that. So that's what we're talking about. Now, did the task force say only degrees or certificates? No, in our student success scorecard, we're saying, look at the number of people who complete basic skills, look at those who finish 15 units, look at those who finish 30 units, yes, look at degrees and certificates, but there are many ways to measure success, and so our suggestion of a student success task force, if you read those things, and I think really, frankly, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There, there hasn't been a lot of care in reading exactly what we said. So we didn't say that we were going to only measure degrees and certificates. We said we were going to measure a variety of things. We did not say we were cutting out non-credit education. In fact, in recommendation 4.1, highest priority for course offerings shall be given to credit and non-credit courses in the areas of basic skill, ESL, CTE, degree and certificate attainment. So the people who were deeply touched thinking that their class in immigrant education was going to get cut out, unfortunately, they were misinformed. That's not what we intend to do. Financial aid, when we say financial aid for a full-time student, we didn't say loans, we said financial aid. And that's all it was suggested, is to look at what financial aid might be available. Do we want to work for more funding for community colleges? You bet we do. I will be on board with Governor Brown's proposal to increase revenue through his proposal that will be on the ballot supposedly in November. I, I've, I've said that. Just a minute, let me finish. We didn't, I never interrupted any of you. So I'm just trying to say here that we're going to be for more funding. I am in favor of more funding. If you look at my record as a legislator, when tax revenues were brought up for education, I voted for it every time. But we had to get a two-thirds vote, and we couldn't get it out most of the time. So uh, if you say that, this, that we're saying there will never be more funding, we will fight for more funding. But the thing is, we've got to use what resources we have now to the very best ability that we can. That's what we're trying to do. Now, I know I haven't answered all your questions, and we'd have to, we could stay here for another two hours and not answer all the questions. But I did want to make just a little clarification of some of the things that were said so that perhaps maybe they would be answered uh, to some degree 
uh, that you might listen to what we have to say. But take this into account. There wasn't anything diabolical or demonic about that task force. It was put together so we could improve student success. You can disagree with us. You can say, we don't think it'll improve student success. And you might be right, but I would ask you to give us the benefit of the doubt, just as I ought to give you the benefit of the doubt in terms of your motivation. Thank you very much. Member Baca. Yeah, before I make some comments, I'd like to revise my, my motion and have it be uh, that the board receive and endorse the uh, recommendations. Very good. Member Baum, is that acceptable to you? Receive and adopt, or, right? Receive and endorse. endorse. Is that, okay. well, hold, hold on one second, Eric or That's Steve, is that, is that, oh, okay, is that the correct language? Yes, re okay. receive and endorse is the, is the staff recommendation. Okay, okay. thank you. All right. Uh, Member Baca, okay. did you want to speak yeah, further? Yeah, you know, with that, uh, I, I want to just kind of comment on, on three things. And I've mentioned before that, you know, if, if we go through these changes and, and we eliminate a whole population of folks who are the greatest, of, who have the greatest need, and we show improvement, we, we've done nothing to be successful. The only way that we can be successful is if we, in fact, provide the, the, uh, the means, the, the ability for those who have the greatest challenges to be successful. So, um, you know, that's, that, that's an important thing. And I know that the committee, uh, the task force, uh, had that uh, in mind from the very beginning. Um, the other two things I want to mention are, have to do with uh, the, the process uh, that we're going to have ahead of us. These are recommendations. I think it's a, a great framework to, to begin with. But uh, the devil, as they say, is in the details. And so we'll have to go through a process in which people uh, throughout the system engage in a discussion about how we take up each one of these recommendations. We know that there are some resource issues that we have to deal with, some uh, financial considerations. We need to keep pushing, as the Chancellor just mentioned, the legislature and the governor to ensure that full funding is there for the programs that will allow us to be successful. We do know that, uh, that uh, such things as, as, as uh, full-time uh, faculty, uh, fully funding EOPS, um, uh, or, or at least those kinds of programs that have proven to be successful is important. Um, and, and we can only do that through the resources, but the other thing is the consultation process has got to work. It's got to be able to bring in all of those stakeholders mm -hmm. in a forum in which we look at the details uh, and, and consider the 110 unit limit and its impact and the, the, the impact of BOG and so forth. So with that, I just wanted to make those comments uh, uh, and let it be. Uh, Thank uh, you. And I'll end right there with that. Other board members wishing to comment? Member Baum. Uh, first off, also a part of the, uh, the motion was to transmit this uh, report to the legislature. So I, I expect that's incorporated into it. Um, I appreciate all, all the comments that I've heard today, and especially from the delegation from City College of San Francisco, <coughs> where there were a number of students I had a chance to hear from, and, and I, I appreciate all those comments. And you're, you're the lucky ones. You're the ones that have a spot in a community college right now. And, and as I talk to my board members, my vote is going to be also cast not only for the students in the system now, but I'm thinking about the 17-year-old African-American student at John Muir High School in my neighborhood or the uh, uh, Latino student at uh, Blair High School in my community who is hoping to come out of the, his, his high school program and find a spot at a community college. And I don't want to see that individual turned away. Those are the people that have been suffering to the tune of hundreds of thousands for the last number of years. And I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do as a Board of Governors to adopt the reforms that will make room for those 16, 15, 16, 17 year old students and give them hope that they will have the same access to education that these students have had access and have the ability to come speak before us. So that's where I'll be casting my vote. Vice President Perez. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, I'm enlightened by all the students that showed up today. Um, it's encouraging to see that you actually care about what's happening within your local schools. I wish you had all been here when we had the discussions regarding prerequisites, because that's also going to impact you in the same way. 
two things I, I want to advise you and just encourage you about is that you need to be present, not only for today, but you need to be present during all of these discussions that are occurring. And you need to tap into your network across the state to make sure that the other students are present as well. Because today's not the day to come and make the comments. I mean, half of the decisions have been made by this point. You need to be part of the discussion through the process overall in order for you to be impactful. Can you please allow me to finish my comments? We allowed you to speak. Thank you. Secondly, I, what I want to say to you is we as a system have to find ways to streamline some of our funding. We're not going to get no more money, you guys. It's a reality. Okay, everything is being cut with across our state. Everything is being cut. And you can continue to say increased taxes, et cetera. We can all be hopeful for that. But the reality is education is fighting for the same funding as social services and a lot of other programs out there today. What we have to do is how, look at how do we take the funding that we currently have and make more of it. Some of that has to do with streamlining some of our technology that we're paying for on a local level to a statewide level to decrease some of the costs that we're paying locally, to reallocate those fundings to provide more programs to our students that are in needs of these services. And the other thing that I want to say to you is we, it, it's critical. These are just recommendations. That's all they are. The proof is in the pudding, and it has to do with the implementation. We have to ensure that we're prioritizing how we implement each of these recommendations as well as the resources that are allocated. If we don't prioritize and we don't allocate the proper resources, for sure your, your concerns will occur. We will have students that are not being served. So be present, participate, and ensure that your voices are heard, that we are prioritizing what's most important to our students. Uh, Member Berg. I'll be very brief. I, I want to um, thank City College of San Francisco for being so present today, for organizing and being here, and actually for being in, <coughs> pardon me, for being so engaged in what the issues are. And um, I just that, I just wanted to say that. I mean, you make you make us proud to to know that City College of San Francisco is a community college that's really in the know and on the move. Thank you. Uh, Member Storm. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge all the students that did come out today and speak. I think it's vital for us to have our voices heard, and the only way we can do that is if we stand up and we're present and we participate. I also understand that nobody likes change. Change is hard, it's difficult, it hurts. But sometimes we have to do what we have to do to make, the work, to make it work. We either have to plug the holes in the boat and float on, or we sink. This is a system that helps so many different people. We are so diverse. We need to be a part of what's happening, accept the recommendations, and be present for the implementation. That's where everything is going to take place. This is policy, and policy is vague so that you have wiggle room. But when it comes down to implementing and what we're going to actually do, I need you to be there. Everyone needs you to be there. And those that are coming behind us, because this is not going to affect us at all. We're going to continue like we are, status quo. But those that come behind us, like my 17-year-old daughter, we need to make sure that she'll be able to have access that she can get in. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please be respectful. Other board member comments, Member Belinsky. There's been so much said here today that it's kind of hard to come up with one uniform kind of statement on my part as a faculty member who's worked in the community college district for 21 years, or in a, a community college system for 21 years. As I look at this, I see student success as really being about student engagement. And we've been very fortunate today, I think we need to say that and honor that, that a number of engaged students, and Member Berg used the word engagement, a number of engaged students have come here and told us the value of their experience of being engaged. And I think we need to honor that and celebrate it. But we also have to look at the number of students that didn't come here today or potential students who didn't come today because they don't know how to be engaged. 
and they need someone to get them engaged. And I would like to hope that as we move through implementation that that's where it's at, trying to get students engaged. But I hope we maintain our focus. And the reason I say that is because we've tried this before mm -hmm. and somehow we lose our focus. In 1986, 1986, the matriculation act was passed or whatever the terminology was signed into law and when we focused on the matriculation program that provided assessment orientation development of an educational plan reconnecting with the counselor multiple times in a semester it involved having to have a matriculation plan at the college that was being held to and that was under review by peer review in the state chancellor's office and that we did research, and research was a required component of matriculation. When we did that and focused on it, and I was on a college matriculation committee, we could see student success, or we could see the things that we needed to fix in order to make students successful. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true as students have said with the OPS, DSPNS, CalWORKs, all programs and somehow we've lost our focus each time because money comes and then suddenly we're off doing something else and we need to stay focused and we need to try to work at this to make sure that we do focus on the need for full-time faculty that we need to look at best practices that we need to <coughs> continue to stress student engagement that we need to have local ownership it's not here at the state level and that we recognize that we need to move forward to focus on students who can get lost and in getting lost they don't complete their basic skills education and getting lost they don't know how to mm -hmm. transfer because somebody wasn't there and they got discouraged so I'd hope that we focus on this and we we do it in such a way that we empower again people at the local level we empower faculty, that we hire faculty, that we hire staff, that we look at the technology and what upgrades we could do in an effort to make this work and not simply just carry it out because we were told to do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Yang. Um, first, yeah, turn your button on. First of all, again, I just thank you all the students and all the members of the public that showed up and told us how you feel. And I sense some frustration and anger, perhaps but maybe because you guys feel like you guys powerless and couldn't help your situation or didn't have much to do in this process. However, again, this is um, just a recommendation. And I do want to advise every student member that showed up today, don't turn away, don't feel discouraged of this didn't go the way that you guys wanted to go. Be here and be present for every step when the implementation is going on, because that's where everything can change, and that's where your voice is gonna be most important. So please understand, I know how you feel. I've been at your seats doing budget hearings and everything else in the past couple of years. I know how it feels, but please, don't be discouraged of this doesn't go the way you would like it to go, um, but yet keep keep a track on us, keep finding out what we're doing, and keep coming to, to voice um, your opinion on what's important to you. Okay, Member Ramos. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would echo what has been said, and particularly this last comment. I think it's it's very important that the kind of engagement that we've seen here today continue. And I, I think it's also important to go back to what the chancellor started with. And I know that you know it may not seem that way to some, but I think that while there are differences of opinion about where we need to go and perhaps how we need to get there, I think we all share a common interest, a common understanding of the import of education in the community college system throughout our state. I think everyone needs to acknowledge that uh, we may have differences in the ways that we understand the problems or the ways that we get there, but we have a common interest in not being antagonistic with each other in addressing these issues and these challenges. We have a, a common interest, rather, in trying to find the most, uh, the most open dialogue and the most honest dialogue we can have with civility and with an understanding that because we have some differences that may have surfaced in this process, that doesn't mean that some people are good people or right people and others are bad or wrong. Um, frankly, what's gonna happen here, as has been stated directly and indirectly, is that 
this process is now going to go to a much more open public discussion phase in which legislation and regulatory action will be in play. And this, I think, as Member Perez was suggesting, is exactly the time and the place for those engaged members of the public and others who are not here to get involved in the conversation, but in an informed and constructive way, a productive way. Um, we face constraints that we are not happy with either. Um, there's no joy in being a member of this uh, board and having to look at the very things that are creating frustration, anxiety, and concern in the members of this audience. Uh, our goal and job, however, is to not look at just the component parts. We have a public charge and responsibility to look at the big picture. And it's very difficult to have to look at that big picture in ways that at times involve having to pick and choose, involve having to make tough choices. Mm -hmm. Frankly, the legislator is going to have the tougher choices to make and the regulatory bodies that are governed by our executive branch are going to have the tougher choices to make as we get into this next phase. What I hope that we can do, based on the very important insights that have been uh, raised today, is to think about intelligent ways to move this agenda forward where we can through staging processes that don't require an all or nothing approach, through some piloting efforts and some experiments on the ground that ultimately can show us what will work and where there are legitimate concerns where we need to make corrections so that the best approaches, the most effective ways to support success in the multiple ways we define it can be scaled up and taken to a broader regional and ultimately a statewide level. Um, I think that, you know, finally, with all due respect, I understand that in the nature of the times in which we live, there is a sense among many people that came to the microphone that we should be somehow, you know, forcing the K through 12 system to make reforms, taxing people that have certain kinds of incomes, redirecting yeah. state, yeah. redirecting yeah. state. Gentlemen, please. Redirecting state resources. Those are all things that on a personal level I'm incredibly, incredibly resonant with. But those are really well beyond the purview of this board. We have no tax imposing authority. We do not tell the K through 12 system how to do its business. We try to consult. We try to cooperate. We, we can probably have conversations in some measure about better ways to resource our system. But that is not the conversation that we're having here today. The conversation we're having here today is about a very specific body of recommendations. And they are just recommendations, as has been said to take to the legislative and the executive bodies for further discussion, public review, and decision making. And uh, as has been said, I hope that you will remain engaged. I really appreciate the vitality of the discussion, the energy that was brought to it. And I hope that that kind of uh, uh, you know, engagement in the democratic process of our state will continue to help us all get to a better place than we are in right now. OK, other board member comments? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to ask Jerry to call the roll for a vote made by Member Baca, seconded by Member Baum. A motion. Uh, motion, sorry. Okay, let me know if you're yes, no, or abstain. Manuel Baca? Yes. Jeffrey Baum? Yes. Natalie Bird? Abstain. <clears throat> I'm abstaining because I was not. Uh, but Natalie? Oh, yeah. sorry, I always do that. I'm abstaining because I was th this this plan predates my tenure with the uh, with this board, and I therefore had no opportunity to have any input. Okay. <coughs> Joseph J. Um, Volansky. Well, hold Volansky. on, hold on. No, but I believe that the implementation of, of that doesn't, by the way, necessarily mean that I'm not in favor of it. It simply means that I I think that the implementation of this plan is going to just smooth out all the rough edges, and it's going to be very successful. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you've had your opportunity to speak. Let's finish the roll. Let's finish the roll in, Jerry. Joseph J. Sergeant. Volansky, Jr. Yeah. Who is next? Joseph J. Volensky, Jr. Danny Hawkins. Abstain. Scott Himmelstein. Yes. Lance Izumi. Yes. 
Peter McDougall? Yes. Deborah Malumet? Yes. Alice Perez? Yes. Henry A.J. Ramos? Yes. Gary Reed? Yes. Jarena Storm? Yes. Ning Yang? Uh, Ning it does not vote. Oh, yes. Okay, the motion carries. I'd like to move we adjourn. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>